Technology is so complex that no company can do it on its own. Frans, thank you very much for being with us today. In the consumer space, the European tech industry has more or less disappeared. The mobile industry, the consumer electronics industry, and also in the platforms like Facebook, social media. In your opinion, what is the root cause why Europe lost ground in those domains? It has to do with scale uh, and also the guts to invest at scale and to be the scale player. In Europe, we are much more cautious than, for example, the Taiwanese or the Chinese are. We are losing out against the American tech companies on digital uh, because the US is a huge single market for digital with the same language and no internal barriers. Whereas in Europe, we are highly fragmented um, with uh, every country its own regulation, its own language, and it is very hard for a digital startup to scale and to become profitable and to attract a lot of capital. If you now look at Philips, under your leadership, the company is truly focusing on healthcare. Why the strategic choice for health? Well, we live in an era where innovation goes very fast and where you have a uh, winner-take-all mentality. And you need to go very deep in order to, to have profound innovations that truly attract the demand. For Philips to be relevant in society for the coming 50 or 100 years, that first of all, we need to align ourselves with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Secondly, we need to really put our money on innovation so that we differentiate ourselves. And then we need to go full out on solving the world's challenges. And we chose health because we can be directly in touch with the users, the hospitals, uh, the patients. Uh, it is complex because you need deep clinical knowledge, you need deep informatics knowledge, technological knowledge, and you need to bring all of that together. And you need to be a trusted brand. So uh, we focus on where we can really have a differentiating edge. What you describe is on the one hand your unique qualities, but it's also barriers to enter for others, which makes you of course a strong player. What are the top three trends in health? The macro trend is, is that we have a growing and aging population and society cannot afford the burden of healthcare. In comes technology, where digitization will move us from general care to precision medicine. Care that is specific to you, where we understand your DNA, we understand your disease, precision diagnosis will guide towards the right treatment and precision medicine will treat you uh, as an individual rather than as just you know one out of many patients. Data is going to play a huge role uh, to transform healthcare. So we need to make sense out of that data. And we do that through informatics. We do that through AI. Healthcare is reactive. But if we measure everybody, we can be proactive. Care can become more preventative but care can also reach patients at home. So I see revolutions going on in healthcare, uh, very much fueled uh, by the digitization of care. You also focused on artificial intelligence. What does it specifically bring for Philips? What kind of benefits do you want to take from applying artificial intelligence in your business? Well, let me first paint the picture that already today, out of the 1.8 billion euro in research and development that Philips spent, about 50% is in informatics. So we are already a data company. And AI uh, increasingly plays a role uh, to make healthcare uh, much more intelligent. Today, through predictive analytics, we can predict whether a patient will get cardiac arrest or whether a patient will have sepsis. By knowing this hours in advance, you can direct care to who needs it. So Data analytics, AI, actually can make healthcare a lot better and a lot more efficient and proactive. There is data platforms, there is connectivity between all kinds of information systems. So it's a data business. We do have very strong data players in the world. Is the European tech industry well prepared and well positioned to win the data battle in health? Unfortunately, the answer is no. 
um, because for a couple of reasons. First of all, healthcare data in Europe is very fragmented. Hospitals are small, they have not consolidated yet, and the databases are therefore very fragmented. Moreover, the uh, legislation around privacy and data uh, storage do not make it easy for researchers to access large data lakes. And in order to go towards this vision of precision healthcare and to train our algorithms, we need access to a lot of data. That is much easier in the United States and in China than in Europe. So it's a bit ironic because I do think there are phenomenally good researchers in Europe and there's a lot of healthcare innovation in Europe, but we risk falling behind because of the barriers on the data and informatics side. There is, of course, a bit of a reason why this legislation comes in. And that has to do with people being also concerned about the wide-scale application of AI. How does Philip deal with this concern that people have that you have access to all their data. If we can marry responsible and transparent use of data uh, with, uh, let's say, the, the legislation, then I think is, there's no problem whatsoever. But today, uh, legislation is issued out of fear. Uh, and that will set us back. Because I think we need to embrace uh, informatics, analytics, AI, so that we can get ahead, that we can improve access to healthcare, that we can make it affordable, that we can make it better for each individual. But it does require that patients will give their consent that their data is being accessed in an anonymized way, in a responsible way, for future research purposes. I really would advocate for a pan-European uh, uh, federated database around healthcare uh, so that let's say, Europe can lead in healthcare technology. And it seems that after a period where the makers pushed a lot of technology around data into society, that the shapers, the policy makers, step up into the arena and push back. How do we avoid that this frustrates innovation, that this hinders our development of new technologies? Some of the big platform players have gone too far in extracting value out of the data of consumers for their own wealth. So I plead for a responsible way of the use of data, but we should not be fearful to use it. The way forward is actually to have the engaged dialogue with European legislators. Uh, I've personally been in a dialogue with uh, Macron, Merkel and von der Leyen uh, around what is necessary for Europe to win in digital. And uh, there was unanimity, actually, about what needs to be done. We need to roll out 5G. We need to get rules around access to data. But we do need to harmonize across Europe on how we get uh, access to data. We should push our universities to train many more people in data science. So rather than to be fearful about it and back away, let's embrace it, but in a responsible way. Another trend we see is things getting smaller and smaller. We all have a mobile phone, but 30, 40 years ago, this same mobile phone had the size of an Eiffel Tower or a huge mainframe. You sell also huge equipment, MRI scanners, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Are you still selling those big machines or will they be completely revolutionized into something very, very small? I think many uh, things will change. We will see a revolution in the adoption of technology, um, leapfrogging and making it very affordable. That's all thanks to miniaturization. Um, and the, we are using the compute power of the smartphone to actually recompose the image from the ultrasound probe and help people then access uh, the insides of, of healthcare. Um, I do think that big healthcare machinery like uh, MRI uh, will continue to exist. In fact, I predict that MRI will become the standard of diagnosis uh, in the future because it's safe, no x-ray, uh, but we need this magnetic field in order to understand exactly what is going on inside the body. So some things will still stay the same. When we go to the process of innovation itself, this has changed a lot over time. If you look back, uh, a lot of innovation for corporates was taking place in the 70s of the last century in large corporate R&D centers. 
Today, open innovation, ecosystems, startups, uh, mergers, acquisitions, the ways to innovate in your organization have diversified enormously. How, as Philips, do you react on this phenomena? At Philips, we uh, saw this uh, trend coming. And in fact, we opened up our research centers, um, we opened up our campuses, yeah. and we invited other companies to enter into our ecosystem. Technology is so complex that no company can do it on its own. Uh, we need to leverage others in order to get ahead. Um, and that also reduces the risk that inevitably is there when uh, a lot of innovation happens. Um, we still are very committed to innovate and we in fact spend 10% of our revenues in research and development. We are the largest patent filer uh, in Europe. Yeah. Nevertheless, we cannot do it alone. Right? And so we need this whole ecosystem of smart people, uh, smart universities, uh, smart doctors to collaborate with us because that's the only way you innovate in a meaningful manner. A strong digital Europe is about having the right talents. And if you see what's happening, then Europe lacks a lot of digital talents. Can industry, together with government, fuel the talent base in Europe? There's a big shortage of uh, STEM uh, um, talent, and especially digital, uh, and it worries me. Uh, so we need a crash action to uh, get universities to step up. Because there is a brain drain going on from Europe to the United States. And we need to become more attractive because we need these people to educate the next generation. Uh, so it's a call to action where all of us need to take responsibility. Uh, on the one hand, to educate the next generation. On the other hand, also to continuously educate our own workforce uh, so that we stay relevant. Frans, I want to thank you very much for spending your time with us today, with your valuable uh, insights, but also your commitment to innovation, your commitment to digital technology, and really taking the time to be with us, and indeed at a European level, make clear what the makers and shapers do to make a stronger digital Europe. Thanks yeah. very much. My pleasure, Willem. We live in an exciting time, and I'm very much in favor of taking charge uh, and taking the initiative, and I would invite everybody else in Europe to do the same. Thank you.